Well, thank you everybody for coming out. Um, maybe it feels good to be in here since it's 9,000 degrees outside. Although I have to say coming through the parking lot, because I wasn't in the sun, it was very breezy and it felt pretty good, much better than yesterday. So hopefully we'll get over this little hot muggy period and get back to spring weather. Um, so uh, my name's Laura Poplar. I'm a nurse practitioner um, with Ohio Health. Uh, and um, I see patients here in the MS clinic and then also over the um, next exit up on 315. We have an office over there also. Um, and have been with Ohio Health, uh, I think about 18 years now, it's been a while. Um, so I've seen a, a big evolution with MS treatments um, and I've been around long enough, although I wasn't with Neurological Associates, but I remember when there was no treatment at all for MS. So it's really, um, this for me is a fun topic because it's so neat how it's evolved and people don't, I always tell patients it's a little bit like dating. If it's not treating you right, we can kick it to the curb. There are plenty of other choices now, whereas before we tried to coax people into you know, putting up with stuff and we don't have to do that anymore. There are a lot of treatments that are listed on your handout. And I think if I went through all of them, you'd probably be here till midnight. So I thought maybe first I would see if there were certain ones that people were really interested in and at least make sure I hit those and then we can go back and do other ones that are maybe not of quite so much interest. You guys want to shout them out or? The newest one. Okay. I'm so surprised. <laughs> Everybody wants to know about the newest one. Um, are there other ones people want to know about? Okay. That's not on my list because not officially approved, but we'll talk about that. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Tice Aubrey? All right. Don't be shy. Anything else? Pills? Shots? Mm, no takers on those. Okay, so we'll put those a little lower on the list. So Ocrevus, Tysabri, Rituximab. Those are good ones to start with. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit and just touch on a few key things <coughs> as far as MS goes. When people have MS flare-ups, there are all sorts of things that happen um, with the immune system and then the brain or spinal cord. So, and it's really very complicated. It, immunologists spend their whole career studying this and still have trouble grasping all the concepts and trying to understand it all. Uh, so if you have a little trouble making sense of it yourself, don't feel bad. The beauty of having something that is very complicated is that there are all sorts of different ways you can intervene to stop the process. So I can remember in my much, much younger days, uh, remember the days uh, when a car had a, you had to crank down the windshield, the, not the windshield, but the window? I can remember when the automatic windows um, openings started to come in and my dad, who can fix almost everything, I remember him kind of grumbling saying, ah, you know, just crank it down, you don't need that, it's just one more thing to go wrong. And I think about that every once in a while because now it's hard to find a car that doesn't have that. But it is true, when you have all these little complicated pieces, there's all sorts of ways for things to go awry. And that's kind of what happens with MS. The immune system is supposed to know you from things that aren't you, and sometimes it gets a little confused about that. So even when, before you were even born, things that your mom might have been exposed to, she, her immunity transfers, um, at least to some extent, to the baby. So the baby comes out of the womb with a little bit of immunity. And then as you um, move through life, you get exposed to this, that, and the other. You maybe get vaccinations that expose you to things, and you develop these immunities. So each time the immune system interacts with something that is not you, it's supposed to learn a little bit. Once again, all right, this virus isn't me. I'm going to attack it. But I know that myelin and nerves are me, and I'm not going to attack it. So some immune systems, turns out, we're a little bit better students in learning this than others. So with MS, what happens is the immune system gets confused for reasons that aren't entirely clear, and it will start to attack us. So these drugs are designed to interfere with that process. Um, so we'll start. Um, let's start with Tysabri, and then we'll uh, hit on Ocrevus and Rituxim. So Tysabri came out, oh boy, um, I think it was something like 2004, and it was on the market very briefly. 
uh, less than about three months and it got pulled and then they re-released it, I think, it, and that was in 06. So it's been out for a while. Um, it was a game changer as far as MS goes um, because it really, before Ty Sabri, all we had were the injectables. So it was the first kind of new thing on the block. The injectables generally work in a similar way. So this was a, a whole new creation. And it works really well. But it turns out there's some strings attached to that. So people with MS have kind of a hyperactive immune system and we're trying to pull it down with these treatments. Some treatments just suppress it some, others act, or just pull it down some but don't actually suppress it. A lot of the treatments actually cross that line and they do suppress the immune system. So the, the IV treatments, Tysabri, Ocrevus, and Rituxan, dial that down and cross that line. So as a general rule, the more you suppress the immune system, the better the drug works. But you also, the more you suppress it, the more risks you take on. So the challenge is, for each patient, what's your risk tolerance, how much risk do we want to take on to get a drug that works really well? And so there are all sorts of factors that have to be considered in making that decision. Um, so Tysabri works in the, it worked in a way that was new. Um, we had not seen meds work this way. So we all have white blood cells circulating through our immune system, or through our, I'm sorry, white blood cells circulating through our blood system. So they're moving through our blood. They, when you have an MS flare up, they get outside of the blood vessel and attack the myelin, the coating around the nerve. If you imagine that what's actually happening, those are shooting through because your heart is pumping that stuff. So it, it's moving fast. It can't just right turn and come out of the blood vessel. It's got to kind of slow down. It's sort of like um, when you're coming down 315 to get here. You don't just go, oh, there's Riverside, and turn the wheel. You got to slow down, get into the off ramp, slow down more, and, and get sort of merge off of 315. Well, your white blood cells do the same thing when they're shooting through your bloodstream and they decide they're going to get out and attack your, your nervous system. They have to sort of slow down, get kind of up against the blood vessel wall, and then slip through and get out. And the way they do that is they bond to stuff on the inside of the blood vessel wall. Well, Tysabri gets in there and blocks that. So when it first came out, um, a lot of people would say, oh, it's sort of like having, if you imagine the blood vessel wall being made of Velcro, and then you've got a bunch of lint on it, then things don't stick very well. So people used to say, oh, that's the one, it's, it's the lint on your Velcro, used to be what I would hear all the time when it first came out. But anyway, what it does is it helps keep those uh, white blood cells in the blood vessel so that they can't get out and attack uh, the myelin or attack your nervous system. So it works very well. It's IV uh, once a month, but it has some strings attached like everything in life. There's always good and bad about everything. Uh, so I, the biggest hang up with Tysabri is this pesky little virus called the JC virus. Uh, and the, that stands for John Cunningham, who was the first patient that they actually were able to identify the virus in. So it was one of the few things in healthcare that didn't actually get named after the doctor, they finally gave the patient some credit. Notice it was something bad though, so they put that one on the patient. <laughs> so John Cunningham got exposed to this virus, and it, this virus has a lot of parallels to the chickenpox virus. And what I mean by that is uh, when we're little, we get the chickenpox. Now kids these days don't have to get it because we've got a vaccine, but uh, most of us in this room probably got exposed to the chickenpox. We got our pock marks all over, they scratch, they heal up, hopefully you don't leave too many scars. But that virus is still in you. So you carry it through life with you and, and it's fine. Generally it doesn't create a lot of problems. However, <coughs> as a natural part of aging, our immune system gradually declines. So when you're younger, your immune system keeps that in check. But with advancing age, as your immune system weakens, that virus can get the upper hand and it comes back as shingles. So it looks a little bit like chicken pox, but it's not chicken pox. It is just sort of like chicken pox in a little isolated area on your body. And it's not fun. This JC virus is kind of similar. You can get exposed to the JC virus, feel like you're sick, get over it, go on about your life, but the virus is still in you. 
if you've got a good healthy immune system, nobody worries about this virus, nobody really talks about it. But if we give you drugs that suppress your immune system, then that virus can get the upper hand. In this case, with the JC virus, it comes back as this nasty brain infection that we call PML, um, which stands for Progressive Multifocal Leukoencephalopathy. So you can see why we don't call it by its full name. Way too long. So you can get PML. So it's a nasty brain infection. Um, before Tysabri, when people got PML, it typically killed them. Because typically we would see it in people who were HIV positive, they didn't have an immune system to fight it off. Um, they might have been receiving chemotherapy, that suppressed their immune system, so the virus popped up and created a problem. Or um, they, if somebody received an organ, these anti-rejection drugs that we talk about, really are, that's just an easy term for saying, we've got to suppress your immune system. So you've got somebody else's organ in your body, your immune system's going to realize that is not part of you and it's going to attack it. So you suppress the immune system so that doesn't happen. So those people were in a real jam when that happened because it's very hard to help them. If, you know, it's, we don't have a great medical treatment for this. And you, if you're getting chemotherapy, well, you've got to kind of keep taking your chemotherapy. It's just, it's just a rock and a hard place. With MS, this is a little different scenario. You have a hyperactive immune system. It's not suppressed like this, these other groups I was talking about. So with Tysabri now, we've gotten smarter about this. Um, people who have been exposed to this virus who take Tysabri are at risk for getting this brain infection. And people are surviving it now. There are more people with MS surviving it, um, but it is still killing patients. It's very important that if it does happen that it get caught very early. And now with other treatment options available, uh, a lot of times, it depends on the risks and tolerance and that sort of thing like I was talking about before, but sometimes we just pull people off of it. So if they're on it without, and they don't have any testing that shows they've been exposed to the virus, but eventually they do test that they've been exposed, then sometimes we'll just take them off Tysabri, and then that really minimizes that risk. So Tysabri first came on the market and about, as I recall, it was just shy of three months, they pulled it because two people who were in the study that got the drug FDA approved popped up with this strange brain infection. Um, and they kind of wondered if it was Tysabri, but in the studies it might have been Tysabri in conjunction with another medication and we weren't sure. And then a third patient got the same brain infection who had not been exposed to anything else and then we knew it was, this was an issue with Tysabri. Um, so it, is, it got back on the market because patients said, I want that drug, it worked really well, the other treatments that are available were not getting the job done for me and I want to take that risk. So a lot of patients testified in front of the FDA, they looked at the data, they had the drug company collect more data, it, it was a kind of long drawn out thing, but eventually they said, okay, we'll put it back on the market. We're going to have the drug company keep track of every patient and every dose that's administered. So basically, they just create a big safety study. So we know a lot more about PML, what to do when it happens, who really is at high risk for that, and who is at a little bit lower risk. So we can sort of stratify, you know, if you're standing on ice that's thinning out, we can get you off the ice before you crash into the water. Uh, so we've learned a lot from that. It was very expensive for the drug company, and of course, Tysabri became increasingly more expensive as a result, but um, it's, a, it's a great product. It works very well for a lot of people. You just got to weigh out risks and benefits and, again, take that on an individual basis. Uh, questions about Tysabri or PML or any of that? Yes? With the JC antivirus, like the antibodies, what makes it, the levels go up and down? Oh, my gosh. So he wants to know with the JC testing, um, you, so you can get your blood drawn to have your to see if you've been exposed to the virus, and then if you, along with that, we get this thing called a titer, which is I always sort of explain it as it's kind of like how heavily, how strongly were you exposed to the virus? So some people will test positive, but their titer is low. They their risk for getting PML is lower than someone who tested positive for the virus and their titer is high. So people spend a lot of time looking at titers and it's gone up or it's gone down. 
I have asked your question many, many times, and I've never gotten an answer that satisfied me. That you know, people hem haw around and dance around it, but I've never really gotten a clear cut answer. There's some variation with the testing. It's sort of like, um, oh, if you're a baker, uh, you know, and you you you've made the same recipe many, many times, but sometimes it was a little better, it didn't turn out quite as well, or you're cooking something, like, I don't know, it tasted a little bit better last time. Even though you followed the recipe, it just didn't seem to come out the same way. I think there's some variation with that. But we do get very nervous if we see somebody with a relatively low titer that spikes suddenly. Um, that makes us nervous from a PML standpoint, because they have, that's one, uh, trend that they've noticed with PML is low titers that'll shoot up. And we have had that happen a couple of times with our patients, thank God. It was not PML, but we were pretty nervous at first. We were repeating the testing, getting them in for an MRI, and um, it, it, to make sure that nothing serious was going on. And we did pull them off the drug because it really it spiked quite high. So if it, um, you know, if your level is 0.4 and the next time it's point five or the next time and the time after that it's 0.36 we don't get real nervous about that but if you're 0.45 and you shoot to 2.87 that's gonna make me nervous I'm gonna be calling you it's well the thought is maybe the immune system is getting activated to the virus which is scary because it you know if you if you got exposed to the virus three years ago and we're testing you and you're tighter, we can see that you've been exposed, but your titer's low, and then all of a sudden it shoots up, it, our concern is, oh no, is the immune system all of a sudden getting fired up about this virus because it's reactivated? Is that virus airborne? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can pretty much catch it the way you would catch a cold. So sneezy, drippy people. <laughs> Good hand washing, that kind of stuff. Yes? Some people do. Mm -hmm. Some people do. Now, I've had patients where, so it's sort of a two-way street. The patient can be comfortable with the risk, but if I'm not comfortable with the risk, like we both have to be on the same page with that. If I have somebody with a titer that's 3.2, I don't care how comfortable they are. I am not prescribing that drug. That's too high. That does not usually happen, though. Um, but we do have people who are JC positive who have stayed on Tysabri. Um, you know, and again, I think that's an individual thing. If you've tried a lot of the other ones and they weren't working, and this is what shut things down, you might do it. I have patients that want to treat very aggressively because they want to get their kids up and running, you know, flying on their own. I have other people that will say, uh, I have kids, I can't take that risk. It's funny the perspective people have. Yes, sir. And so this treatment, what is the result? Is so stopping the degeneration, or are you revitalizing it? Um, you're really stopping progression. Or I shouldn't even say that. You're dramatically slowing it down. Okay. We don't have anything that just flat out stops it, but we're getting close to that. Um, the drug company would like for sure to say they're revitalizing things. They don't have enough research to really be able to make that claim. I do have patients that feel better on it than other treatments. And they've looked at, you, know, you better believe the drug company's been looking at that, trying to find any way they can um, prove to the FDA <laughs> that particular issue. But um, they have not been able to hit that mark yet. On all the testing and all the whatever, have you come up with any good reason what starts it in the first place? Oh, no, it's still the $100,000 question. He wants to know what starts all this mess in the first place. Well, there was a day, and I still think they think that somewhere, some of the high dairy areas, mm -hmm. dairy farm areas, mm -hmm. have more of it. They've, yeah, they've looked at environmental One things. Up is every other farm was dairy farm. Yeah, right, right. But a couple of weeks ago, I took a load of lumber up in the northwest corner of Ohio, and it's all farm ground. Yeah. I didn't see any dairies. And the man was walking around with the cane. I said, what'd you do to your leg? Nothing. Got MS. I've got it. My neighbor's got it. The man across the road's got it. Oh, my and gosh. The man on down the road's got it. There's four of them on one nest and have MS. 
Wow. What in this wide world? This is not a dairy area. Yeah, right. Wow, that's weird. Four just in one little Four in one, spot. one little row. Not even related to each other. Hmm. They've been uh, eyeballing the Epstein Barr virus for a long time. Lots of us have been exposed to it. Uh, but if you get a big group of people with MS and a big group of people without MS, you'll see more people in the MS group testing positive for it. But they haven't, beyond that, they can't connect the dots. There are plenty of people who have been exposed that didn't get MS. So maybe it's that and something else and everything just lining up perfectly that you know, there's, there's a, some genetic predisposition. It's kind of weakly genetically linked, but um, there's something there that lines up. It's been, I hope that I live long enough to get an answer to that question because I really want to know. It even. a tremendous step in curing it. What's called I know it. Well, and the, one of the things that when I get a little down feeling sometimes about oh, are we ever going to figure this out one thing that does make me feel a little more optimistic is we don't even necessarily have to figure it out for ms if we could just figure it out for one autoimmune disorder and there are a whole slew of them that might crack the case for all the other ones um, so i sometimes i depends on what day you ask me <coughs> and a lot of times it hinges on who i've heard speak <laughs> and sometimes i walk away with my head hanging thinking we're never going to get an answer and then other times I feel more optimistic about it. Um, so let me, I want to give, give you guys time for questions. So that was kind of the down and dirty on Ty Sabri. I could spend a whole hour really talking about it, but those are sort of the highlights of it. But I think that's a good starting point because I wanted to make sure that we talked about this PML issue because it spills over into other areas. Yes, sir. Did you start, with, just a quick question, did you start mm -hmm. with Ty Sabri because you think it's the best treatment? No, I started with it um, because I wanted to talk about that PML issue because that sort of laid the groundwork then for all the other meds that have come out since. Foster, he's a big Ty Sabri guy. Yep, yep. Um, it's a really, I think if you're JC negative, it's a great drug because it's pretty convenient. Well, if you don't live in Timbuktu. Um, that's a bit of a nuisance, the drive all the time, but it works really well, generally well tolerated. Sometimes people feel better on it, um, but there are some strings attached to it. Um, Excuse me, what yes, are you talking about? Ty okay. um, So um, let's talk about Ocrevus next. That's the one that just got approved. Everybody's excited about. Um, so that got approved at the end of March and um, I'm cautiously optimistic about it. Um, I think we're coming to the, well, I hate to speak for other people, I'll, I'll say me. I'm coming to the table with a little bit more comfort level with it than some of the other new drugs because it's similar to another drug on the market called Rituxin. Um, <laughs> put those right together. So Rituxin uh, has been out on the market for a while. It was FDA approved actually for lymphoma, which is a blood cancer where people get too many white blood cells. Um, but based on how it works, some MS specialists said, hmm, I think we could cross over and maybe use this for MS. Um, it's, there aren't typically lots of people on Rituxin because it's been hard to get insurance to cover it because it's not approved for MS. But it's, we use it occasionally with MS, and we use it with things that are very similar to MS. So we've prescribed it. I think we've, because of that, we've got some comfort level with it. We've managed it. Um, you know, you feel a little more, uh, on my end of it, you feel a little bit more like, okay, I kind of know what the risks are. I know what labs I want to check, how often I want to follow up with this patient. I've got a little bit of experience with it. Um, so then when Ocrevus came out, I think we warmed up to it pretty quickly, um, but it's still a new drug. We don't have a lot of long-term data. So I think there's still that little part that's like, in my head at least, that I just wanna be cautious about it. Um, so rituxin with MS, uh, that's an IV treatment. Um, you might, it, there's no hard and fast way to prescribe that because it's not FDA approved for MS. So people, everybody's got their own kind of protocol for that. You probably would get a dose maybe every three months, possibly every six months with it. So it's not super frequent dosing, which makes it convenient. It's fairly well tolerated, but people can feel kind of crummy 
when they're actually getting the drug. So typically we pre-medicate with some steroids, Benadryl. What happens is the immune system starts to get a little bit fired up when you dump this right into the bloodstream. So if we can settle that down with steroids and Benadryl, maybe some Tylenol, something like that, that usually will work pretty well. But its main protein is made from mice. Um, so it's a, a mouse-based monoclonal antibody, which is just mumbo jumbo for saying that it's going to dial down immune system function by attacking lymphocytes, which is a kind of white blood cell. And again, people with lymphoma have this abundance of them, so we need to lower their blood levels of their lymphocytes. Same kind of thing um, will work with MS. So um, the fast rules with rituxan and MS. Um, it depends on how the prescriber wants to do it, and, and a lot of times it's I think gauged on how the patient responds. You might do it a little more frequently, a little less frequently. But it goes after lymphocytes. Now, Ocrevus, yes? I was wondering, which one do you get the steroids first, the Ocrevus or the Ritux? Well, actually, both. Oh. And I, I, actually, what I really should say is that's how we're doing it. Okay. Now, you might go some places and they may say, we don't do that. Okay, um, yeah, because with both of them, you can start feeling kind of crummy. So she wanted to know w some clarification on which one do you do steroids and Benadryl with. It's really, for us at least, we do it with both. And the reason for that is Ocrevus is very similar to Rituxan, but its main protein is more, clo it's more humanized. It's closer, a closer kind of protein to what we would have in our bodies. Um, so it's probably... a I think in my limited experience, since it's a new drug, a little bit better tolerated than uh, rituxan, but I've not read any research on that. I just my little bit of experience since Ocrevus has come out. Um, but they work in very similar ways, but again, they're not exactly the same. And in the rituxan group, we have seen PML in that group. Now, the incidence seems to be lower than what we see with Tysabri. But a little footnote to that is people with lymphoma, just by virtue of having lymphoma, the condition Rituxan is approved for, that is a risk factor for PML. So there are some people that think we might see PML with Ocrevus because we see it with Rituxan and they're so similar. There are other people who will say, I'm not sure we're going to see it. I think that P those PML cases might just be because those people had lymphoma. There has not been any PML with Ocrevus at this point. Now, I will say the FDA looked at the data and said, yeah, there's not been any PML, but we want you to say something about it in, to the drug company. We want you to say something about it um, because we think it's a risk. And I would rather err on the side of caution. So I go into it thinking it's a risk and I'm going to watch this patient very closely. Because I'd rather be overcautious and drag somebody in for a few more office visits than miss PML. That would be pretty bad. Do you yes, sir. Do the, uh, for the JC on that? Um, some people do, some people don't. Uh, the FDA, when they approved it, did not say that you have to do JC <coughs> testing. But there is a lot of blood work that we typically do before we start people on either one of these drugs. Um, and because again, it kind of goes back to these drugs also cross that line and suppress the immune system. So for instance, with Ocrevus, if you've ever had hepatitis B, there's another virus that goes after the liver that can reactivate when you give somebody Ocrevus. Yes? What if you've had the hepatitis B vaccine? That's great. You don't have to worry. So she wanted to know about hepatitis B vaccine. If you'd had it, no worries. It's only if you get the virus. It's sort of like, uh, well, I mean, that's not a good example. I was going to compare it to, to chicken pox and shingles again, but that's not a good example. So if you've had the hepatitis B, um, any sort of vaccine, that, that's not an issue if you've had them before you start the med. Yeah, yeah right. Um, so there's some testing that we do ahead of time. And again, because it's new, I think we're testing. It's not, so it could reactivate hepatitis B. Why couldn't it reactivate hepatitis C? There are different kinds of hepatitis. So the FDA didn't say we should check, but we're checking. Um, it, we're, so we're doing some general screening of things that we've learned from other drugs on this list that have been a problem. We're just doing a little baseline blood work to check that stuff too. Um, so for instance, 
tuberculosis is something that we're starting to see, well, we've been starting to see it come back in this country. It used to be, you never heard of tuber tuberculosis, but it's starting to kick up again. Well, if somebody's got tuberculosis and we suppress their immune system, that's a problem. So we're doing a little bit of TB testing <coughs> before we start some of these meds, checking for hepatitis, even if people say, no, no, I haven't had it. Sometimes you can get exposed to that virus and not know it. It doesn't always make you feel so horrible. So sometimes people have it and they don't know. So we're just testing. Um, we want to make sure that they have antibodies to the chickenpox virus. Um, if you've had the chickenpox, you there's a very good chance you've got the antibodies, but not always. I've found a few people over the years that did not have the antibodies. So if you don't have the antibodies, it doesn't matter if you've had chickenpox in the past. If you get around someone who's in that contagious stage of chickenpox, you're going to get it again. Because as far as your immune system knows, it's never come across this virus. So uh, we don't want to, in somebody who doesn't have antibodies, we don't want to suppress their immune system and then have them catch chicken pox, that's not going to be pretty. Chicken pox as an adult is not fun. Anybody know any way he's gotten it as an adult? No, it's not fun. It's much easier to get that when you're a kid. And kids now typically get vaccinated, so they don't even, they're lucky. They don't even have to go through the whole chicken pox thing. So there's some other viruses that we screen for before we start these medicines, because if we're suppressing the immune system, we need to know ahead of time that it's safe to do that. Uh, so, dosing for rituxan is a little bit variable. Dosing for ocrevus is pretty well set. Um, the first dose we split in half, and you get half a dose, and then two weeks later you get another. You get the other half, and that's given IV. And then it's a full dose every six months. So dosing-wise, that's pretty convenient. Even if you do live in Timbuktu, it's a couple trips into the infusion center. I uh, spend some, several hours here hanging out with us, and then you're back home. Um, but we, they split that first dose with the thought of being maybe that would dial down some of the um, side effects from taking it, make it a little easier to tolerate. But we really have not had a lot of issues with it. it we've had people complain of symptoms, but the, it's all been manageable. Um, itchy ears, a little bit of a picky throat. Um, sometimes people feel a little like you do when you have a fever, kind of muscle aches, maybe some chills but it's not been you know, a miserable experience <coughs> for anybody. Um, so we've been pretty lucky so far with that. Um, there's uh, infusions every six months, so we'll be seeing patients in between there to monitor how they're doing. Um, when you dial down immune system function, you know, we're not dropping it to the floor with these drugs, but we are pulling it down, so we do see a little increase in with ocrevus and sinus infections, upper respiratory infections. They had some uh, pneumonias with it, some skin infections. Um, so I always tell people just, you know, take a good look. Make sure you're not breaking out in any kind of funny spots or anything. Or if you cut yourself, um, if you get sick, we, you know, you, we're all going to get sick. That happens sometimes. But we want to see you kind of springing back from that like you normally would. And if you're getting stuck where you can't kick a cold or something like that, or you've got some wound that's not healing, anything that is sort of different from what's normal for you um, is worth a phone call so that we can decide what are we going to do about this. Do we need to get worried? Do we need to get you into dermatology? How are we going to handle that? Um, in the with Ocrevus in their testing. This drug was approved for primary progressive MS, which is really great because it's the first one for that. And we've needed something for that a long for a long time. So yay, we finally have at least one treatment for that. Um, it also was approved for relapsing forms of MS. Um, so I think especially because of the primary progressive indication from the FDA, that created a lot of buzz. And our phones were ringing off the hook on March 29th because <laughs> it got approved in the evening of the 28th. Um, there were, so they did it because it was, a, they tested it in primary progressive and relapsing patients. Uh, they had a couple of different studies going on. So in total, there were 781 people who got Ocrevus in the studies. And then their comparison was either Rebif, which is an uh, injection that's been on the market for a long time, or placebo, uh, because in the primary progressive people, we didn't have any other treatment, so they would have that um, against placebo, and 
felt like ethically that was okay. We don't like to do a lot of placebo trials in relapsing remitting patients because that's like, well, you know, we don't want you to treat your MS because we need to see if this drug works. Ethically, that's just doesn't, that's not right. We've got all these other treatments. And at this point, I don't really care if it works better than nothing. I want to know if it works better than the other things I have to choose from. So they're kind of moving away from these placebo-controlled studies in the relapsing group because there's so many, you can see on the list, there's so many to choose from. Um, anyway, so 781 people got Ocrevus, 668 people got either placebo or Rebif. There were six people in the Ocrevus group that got breast cancer. Nobody in the placebo or Rebif group got breast cancer. So that kind of looks a little fishy when you're looking at it. But if you look at those numbers, six out of 781, that incidence is not really any higher than the general population for breast cancer. So I'm sure there are people in there that got a flat tire too. That doesn't mean Ocrevus caused it. Sometimes these things happen. What's actually kind of weird is that nobody over in this placebo and Rebif group got breast cancer because Statistically, somebody, a couple, five or so, probably should have gotten it. Um, but since it came out zero over here and six over here, it just looks a little fishy. So we're kind of eyeballing that just to see, is there anything about this drug that might bump up a risk for cancer? Um, the FDA did not get too excited about that because that percentage is no different than the regular population. So they did not really make the drug company own up to that, but the drug company did say, we will put something in our printed information about it. So I was glad to see that. Uh, so I always figure this is a good, when I'm talking to patients about Ocrevus, I feel like this is a good time to put that plug in for getting your mammograms and pelvic exams and colonoscopies and get your prostate checked if you've got one and um, you know, all these cancer screening things. If you get a little mole that looks a little funny or you've got some history of skin cancer, get in every year, get a good skin check with your dermatologist. They'll look over you know, all the areas you can't see to make sure there's not something there. Because your immune system does, we think about it playing a big role with infection, but it also does play a role in decreasing your risk for cancer. The little cell mutates. Um, the immune system can pick up that the DNA of that didn't really transfer, and it'll attack that cell. Now, clearly, it's not perfect, or we wouldn't have cancer, but um, it does help play a role in preventing cancer. So again, if we suppress the immune system, well, maybe we would see some little uptick in cancers. We don't know. So they're definitely going to be watching that. Um, they are not tracking it, though, like they did. The FDA did not make this drug company track that the way they made Biogen track that whole JC virus and all the drugs. So um, that's nice in terms of keeping costs down, but you don't get that big safety um, study going. So, but you know, we'll be watching that closely. Questions about any of that? Yes. Good question. So she wants to know if we're having any trouble getting insurance to cover it. Uh-huh. <laughs> but we have trouble with practically all of them. You just have to butt heads with them and explain why you're picking this drug over something else. Um, there, it seems to go through easier with some insurances than others. Um, right now, I don't know the exact numbers, but for the infusion center here, we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to 250 people lined up for Ocrevus. Um, they've, I think, infused somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or so. I'm not sure exactly on the numbers on that. So they're working feverishly to get these approved. In fact, it's, they're so inundated with requests that um, the people, we have two people working on it, and they're just taking stacks of Anthem patients, put them all together, call Anthem, sit on hold for 30 minutes, and then when you finally get someone, okay. Patient number one, patient number two. <laughs> so when they've got someone on the phone, they're trying to knock them out to get people through the system as quickly as we can. Um, and then hope, usually that stuff is approved for a year. So then the next infusion should be good and then it's gonna be back at it the following year. Is this one of the ones that you have to like fail two medications in order to be on this? That's up to the drug company. Um, the FDA did not say that. Okay. Um, from what I've talked to about our people who are trying to do the insurance end of it, they're not really hearing a lot of that. 
Now that might start happening. In part, right now it's sort of good and bad. Um, sometimes you can slip them through because the insurance companies don't know any better. But once they start catching on, then you know they may start putting, attaching some strings to it. Um, the primary progressive people, there is nothing else. So that we don't have to worry about it, at least with them. <coughs> yes? I'm a primary progressive person. My insurance company has already rejected me. They oh. have already. Re so she was saying she's primary progressive, and they've already said no. Well, that's because they approved me for rituximab, and now they don't. It's like, now we have to, I have to have Dr. Boster beat them up again for me. No, oh, he will. <laughs> 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 don't worry. <laughs> he, he's got your back. <laughs> So you're still kind of in limbo with it. <coughs> well, I received a packet from them, um, and it had information about a um, assistance program for people who are low income. So it's like, okay, fine. So if the insurance company decides to reject me a second time, I contact the company and we'll proceed with the you may be able to type thing. Yeah, there are all sorts of ways to weedle deedle things, um, if I can borrow my mom's phrase. So in the drug companies, I really, I got to say, they have stepped up, I feel like, with this population of MS patients, whether it's Ocrevus or any of the other ones on this list, they've done a remarkable job of supporting people. They give away a lot of free drug if you can't get it covered by your insurance. They do a lot of copay comps so it's not, so that everything is affordable to people. And I gotta give them props for that because I don't see it with a lot of other problems. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Advertising for the drugs. Why is it that MS uh, gets so much attention in that way? I don't know. I've wondered about that. Now, I am not a business-minded kind of person. Um, it's got to be money. <laughs> I'm smart enough to know that. All the ins and outs of that business end of it, I is I'm not super familiar with. Um, I think there's been. I think there are a couple of reasons for that. I think there have been a lot of patients pushing, doctors <coughs> pushing, nurses pushing to hold the drug companies' feet to the fire to help with some of these things. I think there's, especially now that there's so many choices, that's created a lot of competition. So I don't recall anymore who was the first company to comp a copay, but what I do remember is as soon as the first one did it, the other ones started doing it. Because if, you, if it costs you $50 a month to take one drug, and nothing, especially back in the day when they really were just injectables, if it's $50 to take one injectable and 10 bucks to take another, I mean, I had tons of patients that were like, I'm saving 40 bucks a month. I don't care, I get stuck one way or the other. Why am I gonna pay another 40 bucks a month for the privilege of getting stuck? Uh, so I think they figured out pretty quickly that if they didn't, even the playing field, they were going to lose business, which is not good. And even worse, their competitor was going to gain business. <laughs> so they <laughs> started, it was like capitalism at its finest. People were comping copays left and right. But now it's kind of evolved into giving free drug and that sort of stuff. Um, I'm sure there's some tax write-offs with some of that. It's definitely great publicity. You know, I'm trying to think of it from a business end. I, they are quick to say also that ethically they feel like they need to support people. You know, it's in, in this day and age, in this country with so many resources, people shouldn't be going, in my own opinion, untreated for MS or any other medical problem. Um, we just have to figure out how to spend money wisely and get these things covered. Um, but I'm sure there's some kind of, somebody's done a cost analysis and figured out the way to do it. And you know, comping somebody's copay so you're giving them 50 bucks a month, that's the best money they ever spent. That's way cheaper than advertising. And then they get whatever the insurance company is gonna pay for it. I mean, that's a great return on your investment. And people get all excited. It creates a lot of loyalties too with patients. I mean, I've had patients say, well, I don't wanna come off this drug because they've been so nice to me and they've helped me with so many things. And uh, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, you do hear it. I have some patients where they're even, they're, um, uh, deductible is paid. Yeah. Now that's really sweet. I think, so now you, you don't have to pay anything for your MRI. Or if your gallbladder goes nuts, you've met your deductible. So, you know, the people think about that when they're trying to decide, do I want to come off this drug? You know, I hate these shots. 
there are all these pills and IV treatments, maybe that'd be easier, but get my deductible, especially in this day and age with high deductibles, it keeps people on. <laughs> Other, yes? The last one on the list, it says the IV infusion is yearly for two years. Mm -hmm. So she wants to know about Lemtrada is the last one on the list. Yeah, what is Lemtrada too? I've heard of it. I was going to ask you about it. You want to know what it is? Yeah. Okay. So Lemtrada came out uh, a couple years ago now. And it's given, um, you do it, it's IV every day for five days. And then a year later, you do every day for three days. And then we wait and to get back to your question, well, what happens after that? We wait and see. So it, um, is the most aggressive treatment that we have. A lot of these medications attack either B cells or T cells. They're different kinds of immune system cells. Lemtrada attacks them both. Uh, and it, so I was saying back at the beginning, I was saying as your immune system gets exposed to this virus and that virus, it gets smarter about what's you and what's not you, or at least it's supposed to. But sometimes that doesn't happen. We always say Lemtrada is sort of like going back to school like remedial immunology. So it knocks down, it kills the B cells and the T cells. And that allows then your immune system to kick back in and sort of regenerate them from scratch. Um, so it's sort of like a do-over. Um, the other drugs tend to, they work in different ways, but some of them interact. So a lot of times these um, immune system cells can just be floating around and they don't do anything. And then when they come in contact with something else, they start to activate, and that's when they create trouble. So I say it's sort of like teenagers. There's just, you know, as a parent, you can influence your kid, but their friends influence them a lot too. And sometimes they influence them in a good way, and sometimes in not such a good way. So, or it's sort of like, you know, that where the, you put a Mentos in a bottle of pop and pfft, it goes crazy. Mentos by itself doesn't fizz. The pop doesn't really fizz by itself, but when you put them together, it creates a reaction. And the immune system's like that. So these immune system cells come in contact with this, that, and the other, and it activates cells. And most of these drugs interfere with that interaction. Um, so the cells that are out there divide and make more cells and make more cells. So if there's something a little off about that cell, it keeps dividing and making more cells that are a little bit off. Lemtrada just <coughs> obliterates them. So you start over, you grow new ones, and the hope is this time around, they'll be a little bit better students and learn better what's you and what's not you. Um, so after that second round of Lemtrada, we kind of wait and see, we don't treat. We just wait and see what happens. If somebody starts to have symptoms that are a flare up, then um, the general thought is you would go back and redose them with Lemtrada. Because the drug is still kind of new, we haven't figured all of that out yet, or we, haven't, we don't have a lot of experience with it, I should say, because it takes you two years just to get through the normal dosing. And then most people, somewhere in the high 70s, 75, 80% of people are good for at least five years. Well, it hadn't really been out on the market that long, so we're not quite sure yet, but we probably will redose them, um, probably with another maybe three doses of it, knock it back down and try again. Or maybe it's possible you could switch to something else. There's not a lot of science to guide us, and there's not, as far as the approved dosing, it, there's, it doesn't tell you what to do. So that would be something you'd have to figure out uh, with the MS specialist, uh, what's the next move here. But we will be facing that here fairly soon. Um, we definitely have patients who have finished their second year, and now we're just waiting to see what happens. So that we're going to be faced with that challenge at some point here in the next couple of years, I think. Now, yes. Is it PML a risk with that too? Um, probably. Hasn't happened, but yeah. I mean, because it's knocking the immune system down. It, yes. I just finished my second year. Of right. Lemtrada? Yeah. Okay. How are you feeling? What do you think? Fine. Yeah. Okay. It's quite a hullabaloo, and then when it happens, you're like, hmm. That's it? Yeah. It seemed like such a big deal. <laughs> yeah, but there's all, you know, it's all sorts of monitoring and stuff that you have to do. And so it gets kind of blown up and it feels like this huge thing. And then people go in for the infusion and it doesn't seem that crazy. Just three days of seven, nine. Right. <laughs>
<laughs> Marking time. <laughs> he says just three days of sitting there. Yeah. So, well, good. We'll see how it works out. Got five years, maybe, without having to worry about it. Yes, sir. Clear different treatment. Are they doing any stem cell transplant for MS? Have they tried that yet? Uh, what was the last thing you said? Have they tried it yet? Have they tried it? Um, they yeah, so he wants to know about stem cell. Um, so it's not on the list because it's not approved. They are definitely studying it. Um, Northwestern University in Chicago and Kaiser Permanente out in California are kind of the big areas. Now, I always caution people, you can get online and find all sorts of places that are doing stem cell transplants. Um, that are hocus pocus. It's not real science. It's people are making tons of money. I've had patients go and pay seven thousand dollars and have it done in this little office procedure thing. That is not <laughs> stem cell therapy. Stem cell therapy is not approved yet. They're looking at it. It still carries a pretty high death rate. So they're trying to get that down because we would prefer to not kill people. Um, seems logical. It's about a 3% death rate at this point, which is down from five. Um, so we're moving in the right direction. That's a production, that one is. Um, and it's not some outpatient procedure that you just go into the office and they do some things. And, and the other thing that's always a tip off, if you have to write a check for a very large amount of money, tread lightly. There's something that's, be careful with that. So they are looking at it, and they're using the patient's own stem cells, uh, which is nice because then that sort of avoids any kind of controversy about like fetal stem cell stuff is, gets pretty political. Um, but if it's your own stem cells from your own bone marrow, that's great. We don't have to worry about ethical considerations and stuff like that um, that we would with fetal stem cell transplant. So they are looking at it. It looks promising, but it's still scary. So we needed to keep it look pr looking promising and not be so scary. <laughs> Um, they, what's so difficult with that is they really drop immune system function to the point where it could be life-threatening if you got a cold. Um, so people are, um, they stay there for a long time, they're kept in isolation, you, you have to have, you can't have fresh fruits and vegetables, everything's got to be cooked, so there's no bacteria, and, um, because they really suppress your immune system. Um, so it's a big production, but it's really, the results look very encouraging. Uh, we'll see. They've been working on it for a while. Yeah? What are the long-term effects of any of these medications? So there's side effects with everything, and I know that you guys are checking with liver enzymes and all that stuff. Yes. You know, I don't know if you have anything like 20, 30 years. Do you know? I mean, is everyone's liver still functioning? <laughs> That's a good question. Like so she wants to know long-term, what do we see, or what kind of pitfalls do we see? We have long-term data on those first ones. Um, the interferons that are on the list, and then Copaxone, because those drugs have been around a long time. Beta serone was the first drug that came out, and that came out in 93. So we've got long-term studies with those. Um, those look very safe long-term. We do still check liver enzymes, um, but I will say many times if people, when they've been on those drugs for years and their labs have always looked great, we back off a little bit. We still check them at least yearly, um, but we do back off a little bit. You can, uh, the liver is a funny thing. It's there to pull toxins out of the body. So if you, um, if you get a viral infection or you walk across um, uh, somebody's yard that just put down a bunch of fertilizer, any like chemical exposures, um, medications, things we drink um, or ingest in other ways, that all somewhere has to get out of your body. Otherwise you would that drug would be in there forever. Um, if you also, if you think about your body, just even if you're not on any meds, your liver's still working because each little individual cell that turns into you, that makes you, uh, that's a part of you, is a little living thing. And so it has waste products. So that little, those, all those little cells make waste products that get into the bloodstream. Liver helps clear some of those out and that's ultimately what <coughs> turns into our waste products. Um, so we need the liver to pull stuff out. If you're overworking the liver, what you'll see is it's in an effort to keep up with the work, it'll start cranking out more liver enzymes. So we draw blood and if we see liver enzymes going up, we start to get nervous about that. Now, 
might be from the drug, it might be because you're taking a lot of Tylenol for arthritis, or maybe you're having a little wine, too much wine to relax, or you know, who knows what it is. It might be a viral um, problem. Sometimes they'll go up and then they come back down to normal. So we check that periodically. And I feel like in general we can, I feel comfortable with that because I feel like you can see the problem coming. Where it gets dangerous is if prescribers get kind of slacky and not really doing their job and they quit looking. Um, and then that liver enzymes start creeping up and patients feel fine for a while. But by the time a patient feels bad from high liver enzymes, like the horse is out of the barn, their liver enzymes are through the roof, their liver's probably starting to fail. You know, you missed multiple opportunities typically before that. And occasionally some things will just shoot them really crazy high. Viruses or certain chemicals will do that. Drugs usually don't do that because they don't get past the FDA if they're doing that kind of stuff. Now sometimes you find out after it gets approved, it gets out to more people that that's gonna happen. So it is important to check labs. Um, there really has not been a lot of long-term, with those first ones, a lot of long-term problems. But it, when I remember when they first came out, we were kind of nervous and, well, let's see how bad your MS is and if it looks like it's gonna be aggressive, maybe we'll try these meds. You know, they mess with your immune system. We were very nervous about them. Now we're beating people over the head trying to get them to take their medicine. So, you know, it's, we've done a total 180 on it. The other ones, like starting from Jelenia down, they're newer. Um, Jelenia came out in 2010, and everything after that, everything on that list below it, um, is newer. So we don't have a lot of long-term data with those. So it's a bit of a question mark. I saw, oh, yes. Do um, the doctors check your liver function regardless of which medication you're on for, uh, if you're on a medication for MS? Um, I think that <coughs> it depends on who you're seeing, I would say. Uh, copaxone really is not processed by the liver, um, so a lot of people will not check liver enzymes. I don't typically check liver enzymes uh, when people are on Ocrevit, or pff, when people are on, I don't know where that came from, when people are on Copaxone, I do not typically check liver enzymes, but you might find some that do. What about the um, about? Yeah, everything else on here, definitely. Ocrevus might be an exception to that rule. Obagio, um, that one in the prescribing information says you should check liver enzymes every month for the first six months people are on it. Um, it's similar to another medication that's on the market that has been known to create liver problems. I have not seen it, but I still check liver enzymes every month on those patients because you're going to need your liver. It comes in very handy. <laughs> we want to make sure it's working well. So I do check that on those. And, I, and, and that's pretty standard with all of these. Ocrevus, um, it's a weird medication in how it, is, how it comes out of the body. It just, um, so I'm not really sure. I, I've not talked to the other neurologist. The, the neuro, sounds like I'm a neurologist. I've not talked to the neurologist in our group to see what they're gonna do, because we're just getting people started on it, so they haven't even come back for follow-up visits yet. I suspect we probably will check in the beginning. We tend to over-test in the beginning until we get comfortable and um, see what we see, but also what other people across the country or around the world are seeing with it. You know, just because we don't see liver enzyme problems, if they're seeing it, other people are reporting it, we're gonna keep looking. But it's not really expected with Ocrevus. But definitely with Rituxan, we check. And so again, if we're doing it with Rituxan, and Ocrevus is similar, maybe we ought to look at least for a while just to be sure that's not an issue. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm just curious, with so many medications now, especially the oral medications, mm -hmm. are any newly diagnosed people choosing to go on the daily injections? Oh, the oh. injections, that's not what I thought you were going to say. Yeah, still sometimes we have people that want to start with that. Um, but a lot of people are jumping over those and going to the pills. It, a lot of it goes back to the patient's risk tolerance. Um, and if they really, I have patients that'll say, I don't take anything until it's been on the market five years or 10 years. 
uh, usually I don't hear 10, but sometimes I will hear five years. And they like the idea that it's been around a long time, we know what the risks are long term, it doesn't seem to be a risk, and that does appeal to people as much as they don't want to take an injection. Um, I think also, depending on where you are in life, if you're thinking, I might like to get pregnant in the next six to 12 months, you might end up on something like um, Copaxone, um, which seems to be, of all of them, maybe the safest one uh, if you get pregnant, if you have an oops. Uh, so sometimes that'll, that issue will affect it too. It does happen. I'm humbled when people say, I want to take an injection. <laughs> I had a patient uh, who has been following Ocrevus for a while here waiting for it to be approved and I just coincidentally happened to see him. I think Ocrevus got approved March 28th and I saw him in the office like the 25th or something like that. And um, he said, I'm waiting, I'm gonna call you because I know the FDA is gonna say, weigh in on the 28th, so put me on the list. And he looked me <laughs> dead in the eye, as serious as I've ever seen him, I've known him for years, and he said, I have had 864 injections and I'm over it. <laughs> like he could not wait to get on the drug. And I, I thought, I bet he, I know he's right. He's done the math and he's, he's counted up. He said, I've never missed one and I'm done with it. <laughs> so he was one of our first people. And, and by golly, on the 29th in the morning, bring, phone rings and there he is, <laughs> like, sign me up. <laughs> so we're trying to get him uh, through the insurance process now. And people are tired of the shots. But I still have patients from way back when there were no other choices who were on the injectables and they're working and they're kind of scared to change. And I don't blame them. If it's working, that's scary. That's where it's, I am. Mm -hmm. I'm somewhat afraid to change. Um, I've been, first I started out with beta serin mm -hmm. and now I'm on Extavia. Okay. And um, I really don't like the injections. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not, I'm telling on myself because <laughs> I do not take them the way I'm supposed to. Mm -hmm. and I'm doing I've never them. heard that from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is that when I don't take my injections, I feel great. Feel right. And then I'm like, but when I take them, I don't know if it's psychological or what. But there I are side effects. Oh, when so I don't take them, there, there, no, there's oh, side effects to take them. them. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. sometimes people do feel yeah. better off of them yes. because they're not getting the side effects. Exactly. And I'm thinking the pills. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you recommend um, taking a daily pill over the injection? I know it's a personal thing, but so I would because you're not fully treating. So to me, that's an easy answer. I would change to something. Yes. I don't care. So Whatever you want on the list. Yeah. Because I'd rather see you fully treated. Yes. Um, if you look at that list, I put the injections first in part because they came first, but also because they're the least effective. And that's a totally different tune than I used to say before we had all these choices. So pretty much anything you switch to that's not an injection should work at least as well as beta serin, especially kind of halfway beta serum. Okay. So yeah, I would strongly think about making a change to something. Right. Something that meets your tolerance for risk. Yes. Uh, and then there are other things, lots of things you have to consider. For instance, right. Jelenia is not a great one for a diabetic. Uh, so there are other issues that you have to look at. It's like working a puzzle almost um, when you've got all these choices. Uh, and probably would do some testing first to see what is your risk for this and that and so that you can kind of maybe narrow the list down yes, that's what I would because it like gets a little overwhelming. Yes. Um, so what I have to do, I would have to go back to my um, doctor to have that done or what, how, do, how do I go about yeah, that? Yeah, you would, um, do you see a neurologist at Ohio Health? Uh, well, he's a part of it, Dr. Okay. Arce. Okay, he's yeah. Not too far away. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I would start with him, okay. and I would tell him, Dr. Arce is a doll. He won't. I know. I don't he know. won't yeah. shame you for. I've been with him every, ever since I've been diagnosed. Okay, yeah. So if you say, I can't take it anymore, right. and actually I haven't been doing them for a while, I want yeah. to change to something that so I can fully treat. Yes. Um, 
then he could have that discussion with you. And then it, he does not use all of these drugs. Okay. So he could talk to you about them if there was one that kind of appealed to you that he didn't, he doesn't use. Okay. He can refer you to someone who does use them. Okay. If that's really, you know, the one that you've got your heart set on. Okay. I was um, just looking at the three, uh, one, the three pills. Um, mm -hmm. I I'm not good at pronouncing. No, oh, well, because the names are wacky. <laughs> it's the. Um, which one would you recommend out of the first two oh, pills? You know what? It, that's okay. pretty individual. I'll give you a quickie rundown. Okay. So Jelenia was the first one to come out. That came out in October 2010. Okay. It's a daily pill. I think side effect wise, it's pretty well tolerated. It's a little bit of a nuisance to get started on because there's some testing you have to do ahead of time. Okay. But once you jump through those hoops, then it's not so bad. Okay. Um, so you have to have an EKG where they stick those electrodes on your chest and look at the electrical yes. activity of your heart. All right. That's a pretty easy test. Okay. Um, and then there's another, um, there's an eye test that you okay. um, would need to get done before you start. Lots of ophthalmologists can do it. We do have the machine here. Okay. Um, so Dr. Arce has partners who use it and could even help you get the eye test part okay. and you don't have to necessarily transfer your care to them. Okay. Um, and that's easy. You just put your chin on this thing, machine comes in, click, takes a picture, comes in, clicks, takes another picture and you're done. Oh. It's about five okay. minutes. So you would need that as a baseline. Okay. And then um, the first dose is given typically in the office or someplace where you can have some monitoring for six hours. Okay. So um, the doctor that I work with the most, we do it in that same building where you see Dr. Arce. Yes. Okay. Um, we're down, uh, we got full, and so Dr. Ebank and I got moved down to the lower level of that okay. building. And we've got a couple of cushy recliner chairs so that you can have some place comfortable because you're gonna spend six hours there. Okay. And there are actually two chairs so that if you wanna bring a friend or somebody to, because it's boring. In six hours sitting around a doctor's office? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would add, it might be boring, but it's so much easier than sticking yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. When I first went on Okay. I'm like, this is so easy. Yeah. All I have to do is take a pill. Right. That's it. Throw it back and go on with life. Yeah. Just to remember to take the pills. And that's it. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of a long day, but it's just one day. And just then you're up free. Up. <laughs> um, yeah, so bring some snacks. You'll get hungry. We've got Wi-Fi. Some people sit out in our lobby, watch TV. They, you know, move around a little bit because it's boring. The monitoring is just checking your blood pressure and your pulse every hour. So it's not anything. It's not like you're going to be hooked up to things. It's very easy to do. Um, so somebody runs in, gets your blood pressure and pulse, and then you wait around for an hour, and they come back and do the same thing. So it's nice to have a friend or or take a nap flip through cosmo yeah. <laughs> whatever you want to do you're right <laughs> uh, it's your one day of freedom there you can just kick back and relax so there's some monitoring that goes with it but then once you get through that it's pretty easy that's it. um so that's one of them i saw a hand yes is there enough of push for these ones that are infusion that someday that'll be a pill instead I don't think so. Um, yeah. But, uh, the, the problem with a lot of these is they're proteins. And you put protein in a pill and put it in your stomach, it gets digested just like every other, you know, food. So it never, it gets torn up by the stomach acid before it can ever actually get the job done, which is why they started out with injections in the first place. They had to figure out how to bypass the stomach. Um, so, if it's not a protein-based treatment, you may be able to stick it in a pill. But if it is protein-based, you got to do a shot or put it in the bloodstream someplace so that the stomach acid doesn't tear it up. Um, Obagio is a daily pill. That's the next one. Mm -hmm. I was a little, um, when I was first learning about it, I thought, who in the world's going to try this one? Uh, <laughs> because. It didn't sound too good on paper from a side effect standpoint. Um, you can have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and hair thinning. Ooh, sign me up for that. Um, it doesn't sound too good. My hands-on experience has been great. It, most people do tolerate it very well. I have had, definitely had patients say, my hair is thinning. They still look like they had a totally normal head of hair though. 
It, so I'm sure more was coming out, but it wasn't like, you know, clumps. Now we have had three patients that I know of that have come off of it for hair thinning. Um, two of them, I could see why their hair was really starting to thin. The third lady, I thought her hair looked fine, but it just psychologically, I think, was just messing with her too much, and she wanted to come off of it. But most people do well with it. Um, from the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea standpoint, usually what I hear is, oh, I was kind of queasy the first day or two, and then I was fine. So it turned out to be not as big of a deal as I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. But it can be hard on your liver, so that's the one where every month you got to get your liver enzymes checked for the first six months. And then we back off on the frequency with that. Um, excuse me, going back to the, the first one that mm -hmm. we talked about, can you pronounce that for me, please? That's called Jelenia. Uh, Jelenia. Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't hear a side effect for that. I don't get a lot of complaints. Um, sometimes people will get, uh, they'll say, oh, I get a few headaches. Mm -hmm. But like you, Susan, they're all quick to say, but it is way better than the shots. <laughs> 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 it's always followed up by that. Okay. So uh, the headaches have been a tiny issue, not a big problem. Um, occasionally, um, I'll get people, especially in the very beginning, like the first, oh, maybe month or something, where they'll say, I get these little twinges of chest pain every once in a while. Um, but it, yeah, so that's what my face does, I think. Oh, yeah. no. Um, but then usually they end up reassuring me. I'm like, no, 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 it's not that bad. It's just, you know, sort of there and it's fleeting. It goes away very quickly. And um, so occasionally I'll hear things like that. Um, and, you know, chest pain should always be addressed. So I don't want it, this to come across as like, no, it's chest pain, no worries. Uh, it should be addressed if you're having chest pain, whether you're on Jelenia or not. <laughs> um, but I get very few complaints from side effects. It's just a nuisance to get started on. For six hours, that's easy. Yeah. Um, it was one other thing about that. I mean, as far as the insurance is concerned, mm -hmm. I know we touched on insurance mm -hmm. because I was on beta Sarah and then they told me I had to try two other, um, uh, two other uh, injectables, injectables or something that, yeah. In order to switch. Yeah. I mean, so I wouldn't have to switch and I think it has something to do with my insurance company. Right, yeah. So the insurance companies in the last couple of years have started some things where they'll, some, even people who've been on a drug for a long time, they, um, and again, I don't know the business end of it, I th think what happens is they make deals and they can get this drug um, for a, a better price. Mm -hmm. So they want the people they're insuring to move over to those drugs. So we'll have people, we go through this practically every January anymore, mm -hmm. where somebody has been on their medication for 10 years mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the insurance says, mm, that's not on our preferred list anymore. Mm -hmm. And they're panicked. Um, a lot of times we can butt heads and explain to them and sometimes we can get them to bend, but sometimes they'll say, well, we want them to try this or this first. Um, so we do spend a lot of time on the phone arguing and trying to get them to bend. I'm sure for Rituxan, Dr. Boster was like said, on the phone. Company, yeah. And I really appreciate it's hard to get it for MS in Ohio. Um, I don't know why MS in Ohio is different than other states, but evidently the insurance companies think it is. Um, so they do sometimes pull some things like that. Now, a lot of times, again, the drug company will step up mm -hmm. and say, see if you can get it covered, get them, see if you can get them to bend, and if not, we'll give your patient drug. Okay. <laughs> so, and that was one other thing I didn't mention. So not only does that create a loyalty with the patient, but they're, I think, kind of cozying up to us too, you know, like, well, they were pretty good. Let's see, you know, maybe we'll write it for somebody else too. So I think they're working all sorts of angles there. Um, so Obagio doesn't sound that great on paper, but my hands-on experience has been really good with it, um, pretty well tolerated. Um, the hair thinning thing does not go on forever. It's usually a couple of months and then it resolves. Um, and it seems like it works pretty well. I've been happy with the outcomes of it. Um, and then the last one is Tecfidera. That one is twice a day, and it's for most people, it's better if they take it with food. It's better tolerated, fewer side effects. Um, so that could also cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And we do hear that sometimes. There's several little tricks you can do to dial that down, make it toler more tolerable for a patient. Um, and that one also, after people are on it a little while, usually that stuff will settle down. Um, the other thing it can cause is what they call flushing and over time I've started to I think maybe flushing doesn't quite capture it for some people people get 
really hot and, and really beat red, some people, with it. Um, and flushing to me is like a little rosy hue. And I've had patients that just look like they'd spent eight hours in the sun. They, they get very, very red. But I've had other patients zip right through and they're like, I flushed once and then that was it. I've never had it since. Or I get a little hot and it's no big deal. So it's the intensity of that seems to be all over the place for people. There are ways to make that better also, little tricks you can do to um, dial that down. So there are ways, like many drugs with side effects, to weedle deedle things to minimize that. There's some blood work that needs to be monitored with that. And again, like a lot of medicines, those side effects tend to dial down over time. Um, I think one hurdle that I did not anticipate with Tecfidera is taking it with food is hard for people to remember. Breakfast is pretty good. It's that second pill. If you go out to dinner with your friends and your Tecfidera is at home, you forget about it. it so I have a lot of people who are missing doses sometimes because of that. I, I, that was more of a hurdle than I was expecting when I first was learning about that medicine. So there are a ton of choices. And it's, I love that there are a ton of choices. It is almost getting difficult in an office visit if somebody wants to make a change. There's a lot to talk about. Um, and it's, it's really too much, I think, almost to process in one visit. But when you know your patients, you know their medical history, and sometimes you can ask a few quick screening questions that'll like, all right, we're not gonna even talk about this one because it's not, um, like Jelenia, if you're diabetic, let's just talk about some other ones um, because of risks of it. So you can kind of sometimes narrow that down and talk about a few and then see what the patient's comfortable with. That's usually my approach with it. Sometimes I have very specific recommendations though. So if somebody's on one of these more effective drugs and their MS is not controlled, I'm not going to talk to them about an injectable or something that I think does not work as well. I want to move them up the chain. So sometimes there's like, here's your choice. <laughs> it's one. <laughs> is that a choice? Um, I mean, there's always a choice to stay on what you're on, but if it's not working, it's maybe not a great choice. So it depends on what's going on, why we're talking about changing therapies or maybe just starting something in the first place if they're newly diagnosed. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, so I know there's a risk of PML with Tecfidera. Mm -hmm. Does it seem to be a similar risk with the Jelenia and the Lactia? So that's a great question. So she wanted to know about PML and some of these pills. Um, they have not had PML with Obagio. We think it might be a problem, but it has not happened yet. We think it might be a problem because it suppresses immune system function. They have had it with Jelenia, and they've had it with Tecfidera. But in Jelenia, we're talking about nine cases, and Tecfidera is four or five. No, I don't recall. I think it's four. So it's not like... It's happening left and right. And I'm not talking about my patients, I'm talking about across the world. <laughs> so um, it's not rampant. The incidence seems to be very low. Um, with Tecfidera, it's happened, everybody who's gotten it has had their lymphocyte count, which we can check with blood work, has been chronically running low. So we just don't let our patients chronically run low. So I feel like it's manageable with Tecfidera, which is something I really like about that. I feel like I can see if you're, the ice you're standing on is thinning, and we can get you off the ice and minimize your risk for that. So I feel like I've got some parameters to guide me of when you're getting into the danger zone with it. And it's easy parameters. It's just checking blood work. You know, it's not expensive MRI testing and stuff like that that's going to, you know, kill you with your deductible and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, we have seen it with those. Other questions? No? Is that it? You're all worn out. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Sorry to keep you guys. It is late.